Hello and welcome to another animated look back. You know, when I started Animated Look Back, I don't think I ever thought I would do a review on one of this guy's movies. But then when he made Isle of Dogs last year, that reminded me that every now and then he likes to dive into the world of animation in order to help bring his surreal worlds to life. And if you want surreal, the best place to get it is Fantastic Mr. Fox. It sounds like it should be The Fantastic Mr. Fox, but it's just Fantastic Mr. Fox. So let me start this review by saying, when I first saw this movie, I was about 19 years old, and I didn't get it at all. I mean, honestly, I thought this movie was pointless and it didn't make any sense. It had some good moments, but it was just too strange for me. But now, about a decade later, I'm much more mentally equipped to handle this type of movie. Mostly because you just, you get new experiences and you see things differently because now you have a larger perspective on what a movie can actually be. And now that I've seen a couple more Wes Anderson films, I much more understand the style that he's going for and what he's trying to create. So going into this review, I didn't know how I would feel, whether I would feel the same way as I did before, or if this would become one of my new favorites or something in between. Well, let's find out where I ended up on the scale. This is my review of Fantastic Mr. Fox. Seriously, there should be a the there. It was, it's driving me crazy. The movie stars George Clooney as Mr. Fox, who is a really good thief. One day when his wife, played by Meryl Streep, gets pregnant, he decides to stop being a thief and becomes a journalist. Don't they all? A few years go by and he starts to feel a little anxious and sees that there's three farmers that have pretty much taken all of the food in the area and monopolized it. He decides to pull one last job. He recruits his possum landlord and goes on a crime spree, robbing all three of the farmers. We'll start with Boggus' chicken house number one. His only security is a few old hunting beagles and a low stone wall. Now, a word about beagles. Never look a beagle directly in the eye. And if Why not? Beagles aren't so tough. But that, of course, upsets the apple cart, and now all the farmers want to take this fox out. Now, when it comes to the best part about any Wes Anderson film, it is always the world building. He just has the way of just taking certain things and just making them stand out and pop on the screen. He's, it's a master craft. The thing that I found super interesting with this movie is that this world kind of looks like a Disney movie, if you squint at it, if it was taken more seriously. I mean, we have animals walking on their hind legs, they're dressed in clothes, they live in houses, read the newspaper. That seems like something you could see in a Disney animated film, especially from the older days. Well, I guess also in the nowadays, but that's neither here nor there. But Wes Anderson handles this sort of world that you might see in a Disney movie and takes it one step further. Because obviously the animals don't have the same rights as people. Because when these three farmers are trying to kill the fox, no one is accusing them of attempted murder. But I've already figured out where this fox lives, and tomorrow night we're going to camp in the bushes, wait for him to come out of the hole in his tree, and shoot the castle smithereens. That's how grab you, fellas. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, see why not. Plus, Wes Anderson doesn't really explain what animals can talk and which ones can't. Like, there's a scene where Fox is literally killing birds. Uh, I said one bite. I'm trying. I have a different kind of teeth from you. I'm an opossum. Uh, uh, Give me that. That's so grisly. There's blood and everything. Follow me. At first I thought, oh, maybe this is kind of more like Zootopia than I thought. Maybe it's only mammals that can talk. But then... We see dogs in this film, and they don't talk at all either. So it's like, this specific group of animals, they can talk, they dress, and with other movies I would question it, but that's not really what Wes Anderson movies are about. Basically, because the movies that he makes are normally more about how does the world make you feel, and less about how does this world make sense. I do like the unique perspective it gives these animals, like, because for the most part, they'll act like normal humans do. You know, they're talking, they're civilized, they'll just 
be normal, pretty much, and then all of a sudden they'll just start tearing into things like rabbit animals. Are you cussing with me? No, you cussing with me? Don't cuss and point. You're gonna cuss with somebody. You're not gonna cuss with me, you little cuss. Cuss me. I like this because it shows while they are trying to be like people, they will still every now and then surrender to their animal instincts, and that goes really well in the climax of the film where all the animals use their special abilities to win the day. 28 pine cones fired, 22 targets hit. Decoy phase, go. Yes, sir. I still don't know where Badger got his training for demolition and why he has that, but okay. Beaver, caster fiber. I can chew through wood. Amazing, Linda. Got it. Badger, Melis, Melis. Demolitions expert. What? Since when? Explosions, flames, burning things. Demolitions expert. Okay, Linda. Got it. And they really hit it home with this particular line. I also see a room full of wild animals. Wild animals with true natures and pure talents. And lines like that really work because of the second thing that Wes Anderson films do very well is they have great dialogue. He has a great voice for characters and how each of them would react into any given situation. All the characters have distinct voices, and I'm not just saying by their voice acting, I mean with the way they are written. If I read all these lines from all these different characters out loud with the same tone of voice, you could probably still guess which character I'm quoting just because of the way their personalities are. Now looking at the animation, it is for the most part done really well. The world looks like it's out of a storybook and the comedy is super quick. I mean, sometimes I had to rewind and go back just to see what they were doing in it. Like, there's a scene where Fox and his wife are just running along, and then, then something quick happened. Like, what was that? And he, I rewinded and I looked back, and he, like, placed, a, like, a cloth over a puddle that she could walk over. And it's so quick, they don't stop for you to notice it. But if you do, it, it adds a lot of humor to it. In terms of the whole world, the animation looks amazing and has very fluid animation. I think the places it comes up short sometimes is in the facial expressions. Now, for the most part, I think it works, but there are some times when I, I can't really get a read on what the character is thinking with the way they animate their facial expressions. Like, take this little scene. I'm pregnant. Wow. We're gonna have a cup. Honey, that's great news. Now, I can read that he's shocked, but I don't know that if he's shocked terrified, like, or shocked happy, like, I don't know, I, I don't really get that read off of it. You know, I, I don't really get what I'm supposed to feel with the character in that situation. Sometimes you do get a few looks from characters that feel like they're from the Uncanny Valley, and some people might even say that that adds to the overall feel of the movie. But for me, I always just want to be on the same page as our main character. And there's some times where I'm like, well, I don't really know what they're thinking. But overall, I see the animation is very, very good. Now when it comes to the characters, my favorite has to be Fox's son, Ash. Which I find funny because when I originally saw this movie, I couldn't stand this character because he was so delusional, jealous, and felt like every single thing that went wrong for him was like the worst thing ever. But now I love him because he's delusional, he's jealous, and every little thing that goes wrong for him he treats like the worst thing ever. I just love how deadpan he is and how he gets like, feels like the slightest little thing that doesn't go his way is just such the most ultimate betrayal. You're supposed to be my lab partner. I am. No, you're not. You're disloyal. And then when he doesn't know what to do, he'll just spit on the floor. What are you wearing? Why a cape with the pants tucked into your socks? And even when he is given encouragement, if it's not what he wants to hear, he doesn't really even take it. I'm not different. Am I? We all are, him especially. But there's something kind of fantastic about that, isn't there? Mm, not to me. I prefer to be an athlete. And it makes the movie all the more funny when his cousin, Christofferson, he comes into the picture and Ash is just super jealous of him because he's naturally talented and it's just everything that Ash would want to be. And I like that they didn't make uh, Christopherson a jerk, you know, that they didn't make him just a, a, a jerk that's just showing off in front of everyone. They just made him a guy who's naturally talented and has natural gifts and appreciates them and then just 
drives this other guy who's trying super hard who doesn't have any natural gifts it drives him mad do you mind if i slide my bedroll slightly out from under the train set it's hard to sleep in that corkscrew position there's a lot of attitudes going on around here don't let me get one. And because of that, it makes Ash come across more of the jerk in this, but since I find Ash hilarious, I'm okay with it. I remember when I first saw this movie, there was the scene where they're going to rescue Christopherson because, you know, he was captured by the farmers, and then this scene happened. I can fit through there. Hmm? You wanna know why? Why? Because I'm little. Give me that shoelace. I remember like rolling my eyes like, yeah, yeah, because you're small. We get it. You've been hitting that home the whole movie, and now is your big time to shine. I get it. whoop de doo Ugh. I remember not, I didn't get it, but now I do get it. It being stupid is, of course, the whole point, because that trope is something that was in so many animated movies, to have a character who doesn't think they can do anything, and then in the climax there is something only someone small can do, and then they save the day. So I feel like this movie isn't just using that and trying to pretend like it's an original thing because the way when he says, because I'm small, it's, it's, it's dealt with the same deadpanness of the all the rest of Ash's lines. There's no big victorious thing like, because I'm small, or something like that. It's just all the same like, oh, okay. So I like that they make fun of that trope and they poke good fun at it. One of the characters that I don't think is used enough is Mrs. Fox, played by Meryl Streep. Gosh darn it, even Meryl Streep is good at voice acting. Is there one form of acting that we can find for this lady that she isn't good at? Maybe she's not a good puppeteer. We'll see. Why is he wearing that bandit hat? His ears were cold. He's not with us. Go back to bed. If what I think is happening is happening, it better not be. I mean, I was totally expecting to hear Meryl Streep's voice coming out of this character, or at least made me feel like her voice would sound too old coming out of a character who's supposed to be a little bit younger. But no, I had to remind myself that it was her because her voice perfectly fit her character, and I wasn't thrown off by having a famous voice coming out of this character. Well, at the very least, I wasn't thrown off by Meryl's voice coming out of this animated character. Clooney, on the other hand... Yeah, I know this is going to be probably a point of contention for this review, but I don't think George Clooney has a great voice for voice acting. First things first. It's too distinguishable. I mean, whenever Fox talks, I hear George Clooney. And you might say, well, yeah, duh, he voiced the character. But what I mean is, like, I, I don't hear the character talking, I hear George Clooney talking through the character. Yeah? Well, first of all, one of these beagles has chronic rabies, which he's on medication for, and if you get bit by him, you have to get shots in your stomach for six months. And second, you, listen, I'm not going to justify this to you. Just pay attention and stop interrupting me. I'm taping this. Now, sometimes it can work for some characters, even in this movie, to have distinguishable voices coming out of animated characters, but those are usually characters whose voices are already animated on its own. I mean, you look at Bill Murray and Owen Wilson in this movie, their voices are already good enough that they sound naturally suited for an animated process, you know? Now, sure, Wes Anderson might have put them in this movie because he likes these voice actors, but their voices, while being distinguishable, are unique enough that they work for an animated character. They automatically breathe personality in their characters just by the way their voices naturally sound. Well, it's real simple. Basically, there's three grabbers, three taggers, five twig runners, and the player at whack bat. Center tagger lights a pine cone, chucks it over the basket, and the whack batter tries to hit the cedar stick off the cross rock. Then the twig runners dash back and forth until the pine cone burns out and the umpire calls hot box. But honestly, you could take the audio from any of George Clooney's other movies and put them over this one, and it would sound basically the exact same. Ain't it a small world, spiritually speaking? Pete and Delmer just been baptized and saved. I guess I'm the only one that remains unaffiliated. Well, I'm going to spend my energy on suing you unless you give me a good reason why you're firing Mr. me. Mr. Bingham, the reason's not important. So you're firing me without grounds. Now I really have a lawsuit. Gentlemen, the 3000 block of Las Vegas Boulevard, otherwise known as the Bellagio, the Mirage, and the MGM Grand. Together, they're three of the most profitable casinos in Las Vegas. Hi, Freeze. I'm Batman. Okay, no Batman and Robin clips. Uh, that's where I draw the line. 
Now, is that to say that he did a bad job? I, I, I wouldn't say that. I think that for what he's doing, he's doing an okay job, even though there are sometimes, I'm not sure exactly what emotion he is giving for his voice, as we can go back to that surprise scene. I'm pregnant. Wow. We're gonna have a cup. Honey, that's great news. Yeah, if the animation can't tell you how a character's feel, your voice actor should, and... I was getting nothing off of either one of them in that scene. But as I said, I don't think it's like the worst thing I ever. I mean, his character does have many laughs and does a good job at being a personality. Just compared with everybody else in this movie, I, I feel like he's more the weak link because I can always hear the actor behind the character. But don't worry, if I was like comparing him to Jerry Seinfeld in B-movie, George Clooney is leagues ahead. Honestly, the voice that surprised me the most was the voice of this evil rat. It wasn't even until I got to the credits where I realized it was William Dafoe. <laughs> yeah, he does the creepiness of that rat really well, and I did not once think, oh, that was William Dafoe's voice. I only heard the rat. Maybe my thing with Clooney more has to do with the fact that I think Fox is kind of a jerk. I mean, he is very likable and charming, but most of the time when movies do this thing, when a character has stopped doing something for a long time, and then they secretly go back to it, they're doing it because they have a good reason. Bob goes back to hero work in The Incredibles because he wants to help people. John Wick goes back to the life because they shot his dog, and so on and so forth. Where in this movie, Fox only does this, puts his entire family and eventually the entire neighborhood at risk because he's bored. Who am I? How can a fox ever be happy without a, uh, you'll forgive the expression, a chicken in its teeth? I don't know what you're talking about, but it sounds illegal. Here, put this bandit hat on. It makes him kind of a jerk. And then later on in the film, when they think they have won and Badger starts giving a speech, he just flippin' interrupts him and continues on with his speech out of flippin' nowhere. You're at Badger's place. Well, that's a douche move. Well, <laughs> It took a near catastrophe for all of you to finally take me up on my offer to have you over to the Flint Mine for dinner. But I guess we have- I'm sorry, maybe my invitation got lost in the mail. Does anybody know what this badger's talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but Clive's right, in all seriousness. Excuse me, B. Then he just gives this, like, victory speech, like, oh, hey, we've won, even though he was the reason that they were having trouble and never really apologized for it. But I, I don't want to say that this is unintentional. This is the way the character was supposed to be. Once again, this isn't like B-movie where they're trying to write the character likable and fun and then make him a bit of a jerk. This is where they're trying to make him likable, fun, and a bit of a jerk at the same time. This is all intentional. It just makes him a little bit unlikable for myself personally. I do like how crazy everything gets. How everyone, the farmers and the foxes and the animals, they always up the ante. You know, it's like the fox steals a bunch of stuff, the farmers come in with guns, and then backhoes, and then dynamite, and then snipers. An estimated 108 snipers are currently in position surrounding the demolished fox residence. Any local animals would appear to be trapped underground without provisions of any kind at this point. I always love it when a story just takes one small thing and then spirals it into a humongous disaster. I will say that sometimes I do wonder why Wes Anderson does some of the things that he does. You know, if I went through everything that made me ask why it'd be too much, but here is one that I still don't get. Every now and then we would cut back to uh, the news just recording stuff on the information of what's going on. But we wouldn't cut to any character we actually know. We'd only cut to one of the farmer's sons, who we had never seen anywhere else in the movie, and would never see except in these scenes where he's watching TV. And I'm like, who is that? Why is he here? Why are you watching things from his perspective right now? What? That, that's on fire! Wes, why is this character here? There is no reason that this character has to be in the story at all. The music for this movie is pretty good as well. I love that the little kid's nursery rhyme that they sing about the villain. Oh man, it has a really nice beat to it. And honestly, I've been whistling it ever since I've watched this movie. To be honest, I was a little nervous when I decided to review this movie. 
Mostly because this isn't usually the type of story that I look for in an animated movie. Plus, there's so much going on in this movie, I was afraid I wouldn't get to the underlying issues and themes and what everything represents. And honestly, well, it's every now and then I pick up on that. That's not usually what my channel's about. I'm just wanting to say how I feel the story works as a whole. So maybe I didn't get them all. I mean, the only real lesson that I picked up in this movie was that to be the best you can possibly be, you have to embrace who you are completely. As the animals only win when they all use their own unique abilities to fight back the humans. But once again, I don't really think Wes Anderson movies are really about morals and lessons. I mean, there are themes, of course, throughout this movie, but I don't think that what it comes down to in the end. Wes Anderson movies are all about the experience that it gives you. And for me, while I can say he gave a good one, it's not one that I personally love. I've seen many videos on YouTube about this movie, everyone talking about how it's either one of their favorites or their favorite film in general. And that, I think, just takes a specific mindset that this can appeal to. That's not usually my mindset. But unlike the last time I saw this movie, I can appreciate it for what it is. While it may not be the most amazing thing for me, if you are a fan of Wes Anderson movies, you're probably going to like this movie a lot. And so that's why I'm going to be giving The Fantastic Mr. Fox a 7 out of 10. Huh. I'm hoping the comments will be kind. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. Be sure to join me on my next animated look back where I'm trying to catch back up to Disney's live-action remake stuff, and I'm, I'm reviewing Aladdin. <sighs> See you around.